Welcome to our second um, company visit this fall sem semester. We have Pedro here. They've been visiting our team. Um, Ten years now. Yeah. Um, we do have two of our graduates. And so on. For all of them. Doing very well. <laughs> Remember in class I said there was this guy who had um, mm -hmm. they, out. they don't believe me. This is the one who had photographic memory. All right. And this is the one he followed me and it's in the footsteps as well. Um, Adam Triggers and Ty, he was also a uh, student chapter president as well. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you for bringing uh, oh, the food. Yeah. Appreciate it very much. Um, the floor is yours. All right, that's everything I want to jump in. Will do. Thanks, Dr. Ramroot. Uh, so, a quick introduction here. You press that circle button there. Yeah, the circle, second. You're working. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm not trying to keep going. Yeah. Okay, so quick introduction. Uh, as Dr. Ranger said, I'm Adam Ranger, uh, I'm Director of Survey and Scanning for Hardrow. Uh, based out of Mobile, I am a Troy Geomatics graduate from 2003. Uh, licensed in as PLS in five states currently uh, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Uh, and I've been with Hardrow for about 10 years now. And I'm Tom McBurnett. I'm the uh, Mobile. Survey so lead, I also lead our aerial group. Uh, just like Adam, I'm a Pro grad, graduate in 2017, came in on PLS in Alabama. Hopefully, Mark's also. <laughs> so, we got a quick little video. I don't know if you've got any audio coming through, but a little 30, 40 second teaser about um, a highlight for company. Dude. So we're heavy in the industrial sectors. Uh, we are primarily in refineries, chemical plants, pulp paper mills, uh, and power generation facilities. That's our niche yeah. and companies. And, and that is what our group supports for our group. Uh, video here about overall company we do have a uh, a charitable foundation which we do help help out the communities where our local offices are um there's a lot more information on the website that's kind of what's easier there and then overall uh, we have 19 full service offices across the country in in mexico our latest office uh was in mexico city so we've got a group down there um, that's a uh, company called Techno Hardware. It's a subsidiary of our parent company that uh, utilizes for engineering for the time support. Um, as you can see, most of our offices are across the, the Southeast Gulf Coast. Uh, that's primarily due to where we go and we look at our offices where our clients need us to be. And considering there's a lot of oil refining, chemical uh, facilities, 
uh, along Gulf Coast. That's primarily where a lot of our offices are. Um, we do have uh, President Southwest in California in the Bay Area. Uh, there are several refineries and one plants out there that we support from an engineering standpoint. And we are a multidiscipline uh, engineering service firm, procurement, as well as construction management. Uh, we don't build stuff, but we manage the construction on uh, these design projects, uh, projects. And where our group falls in, we are located in five uh, of our offices currently, six, six of our offices currently. So we're Savannah, Mobile, Baton Rouge, uh, Beaumont, Texas, Pasadena, Texas, which is the Houston area, and Concord, California. So we've got a uh, pretty, pretty decent sized footprint across the southeast, and we go where the work is. So. We uh we travel quite a bit uh wherever our clients and facilities are. So I mentioned all the different full food services that the company uh that we that we do. Um our group here is top center, data capture, uh laser scanning, uh control mapping, dimensional control, GPR. That's our team. Currently there's 17 of us, uh, with six of us being a mobile uh that handle uh, all of that that service so i mentioned we go all over so each one of these little yellow google pins is somewhere that we've had work in the last five to ten years uh you can see a lot of work down in the southeast with our, our presence is growing up in the midwest and up uh the atlantic coast we do have an office in philadelphia pennsylvania that uh their primary focus is engineering uh, or life they can sell life sciences for each they do like Pharmaceutical clients, not a clean room, that kind of stuff. Um, but you can see, you know, we've gone all over. We've got work up in Alaska. We haven't been there yet, but our engineers have uh, the refinery up there. And then even as far down southeast as Virgin Islands, uh, we went to Cruz and Run Distillery and scanned our plant. Uh, it ties been to Jordan uh, in the Middle East. Uh, we had another teammate go to Shanghai, we did some work there. Uh, but, we kind of kind of go all over where the projects are. Get pretty good exposure of uh, the lower 48 working in the area. So dimensional data, that's everything that we do is we measure stuff. Uh, we go and capture existing conditions in a plant facility or it could be greenfield sites if we do topo or boundary surveys and capture the site as is. Um, and that data is then used to support the engineering design, whether it's civil, structural, piping, electrical instrumentation, you name it. If they need to know in an area what what's there, what's the dimensions, can I fit this big piece of equipment in? I've got to run this pipe to this rack. That's where we come in. We capture an area, a project area, dimensionally, utilizing your fundamental uh, principles of surveying. Every project we go on has a total station. Uh, most of our projects are scanned in 3D, uh, either terrestrially. We've got a wearable scanner, walk around and capture data. We were here last year. We brought it uh, walk in the halls or drone, drone LIDAR, photogrammetry. Uh, we've got all the tools to be able to capture that. We can cater those. So what tool we use on the project, depending on what the needs are, accuracy, specifications. They needed 3D as a 2D drawing there, though. Um, all of you are sitting in this room, you know what a total station is. I, I would hope uh, that's our, our workforce. We utilize it on everything, uh, all our projects. We run super tight control networks, uh, process the data through least squares. That's then you need this a foundation to align all of the three dimensional scan data that we capture. Um, GPS as well. Uh, we use that quite a bit in time stuff for real world ports. If we need a, you know, an actual safe plane uh, north and east and uh, NABD 88 data, we'll, we'll utilize that tool. Um, we've got units that work in the woods. You know, if we need to um, go to topo vegetated areas, um, a lot of the times we utilize this on own projects, setting out aerial targets over a larger area or about line of sight. Um, so we got. Got that in our toolbox, and then I'm gonna turn the scanning part over to talk about our presence alert. So 
I, the way I like to explain this thing is it's like our personal ATM. It just prints dollar bills when you print it. Um, but pretty much it's it's a 3D laser scanner. Have any of y'all ever seen 3D laser scans? Scan scanner working one. So yeah, that's what we use every day, day in, day out to capture data. Uh, you know, it's a what you see is what you get kind of thing. Anything that the scanner can see that you see with your eyeballs, it can capture data on it. Uh, and then we take that data, turn it over into the computer, register it, and we have a as-built model of what's there uh, in, a, in a 3D world. Uh, so just like that, that scanner there, so that's DNF 5016, that's what we use everywhere uh, throughout all of our offices. Uh, it's on a tripod, it takes just a few minutes to do a scan. Uh, the picture here in black and white, that's kind of the, I guess, one of the options that it has, uh, or it can collect in color. Uh, but it does not collect in color as it's running. It takes, takes the scan, and then it takes photos. Uh, and then we can stitch those photos together on top of the scan to color out of it. Um, so in order to have a good scan, uh, by our standard, we like to use targets. Uh, we like to use at least four to six targets in every scan in every direction, you know, one in each quadrant spread. Uh, we use those targets to locate the scan and tie multiple scans together. Uh, we shoot all those targets in with the call station tied to whatever quarter system that we're using. So, um, you know, normally we're seeing our accuracies around a sixteenth of an inch or so, uh, which is really high. Yeah, that's the expectation of our type of designers, whatever uh, they're trying to do a new design and make something fit the space. They've got certain tolerances, and the accuracy from us needs to be as accurate as possible. So, you know, I, I mentioned with the total station run the control, closing a loop, running through least squares, that ensures we've got a tight as a control network. So, this is another. Uh, another service that we can provide on top of our regular scanning, it's thermal scanning. Um, whereas instead of using a color camera, we're using a thermal camera. Uh, and they're able to delay the, the thermal images on top of the scan to find hot spots on equipment, um, you know, figure out why things are moving like they are when they get hot versus when they're cold. Um, so that's just kind of an added feature that we can add, you know, to, to our scans. Doesn't happen that often, but we have the random client here and there that's like, hey, we want to start scan this. So I get a thermal scan. Yeah, we get um, odd requests sometimes from our clients and even internal. Hey, can you do this? You know, in one particular case, there was a furnace at a, at a refinery that they thought had hot spots. They didn't even know where they walked, where they were located. Well, it's painted black. You can't see it. Just walk up to it, and the thing is, you know, 600 degrees, you're not going to touch it either. So other than going through with a little temperature gun and going all over the, the piece of equipment trying to find out where it is, I said, hey, we can, we can put this on the scanner and scan it, and then you'll know exactly where it is, pick on, pick on the pixel in the image down to an eighth of an inch and tell the XYZ coordinate and the temperature. Okay, that's fine. So, you know, we, we take the, the the basic foundational, you know, surveying principles and the tools that are out there, and it's a lot of the solutions that, you know, we do are, are not everyday type of surveying stuff that we normally think about. So, um, yeah. So this is just some of the some of the softwares and some of the tools that we use to capture our data. I don't know if any of y'all are uh, familiar with any of these softwares. Recap, Fix 4D. I don't know if any of y'all use that for your drone stuff. Uh, you know, magnet field, we use top so key instruments. Um, and then some of these others, uh, you know, VREX is for your VR goggles. Clear Edge is a modeling software. Aviva is how we use and uh, share our point clouds. Uh, Recap and Navsworks are the same uh, for the point clouds. Uh, the, the one cool one that we've kind of gotten on here now is Sentu. Uh, which Adam has a, a link there to show some of the data, uh, but it's an online platform that we can share data with. Um, I'll go for that. Right. Um, the biggest trouble we have in the industry that we are in is data management and data shareability. Uh, you know, being able to get the data to our clients 
uh, you know, our average scan, if you considered one scan a gigabyte, you know, we may have a scan that has 500 scans in it. So uh, sharing that data is not really easy to just do it through the wires of the internet or transferring it over the whatever, you know, so normally we box it up in a hard drive and ship it at FedEx. Um, so, but this Sentu thing here is, is kind of the bee's knees right here. Now. So a uh, couple benefits to, to scanning, uh, you know, it gives you measurable data, you know, 360 pictures are great, but when you tie up the 360 pictures and laser scans together, you get measurable data. Um, you know, it's safe. We don't have to go and physically touch a piece of equipment. We can scan it from a distance. Um, and, you know, that class free constructability, that's a big one for our, for our engineering, uh, where they can design new pieces of equipment and make sure that it's going to fit or it's not going to hit other things that are in the area. Uh, you know, we've done scans of routes where they need to be bringing, uh, Big pieces of equipment through on crawlers and whatnot, make sure they're not going to get light poles or handrails and buildings and you know anything. Uh, but that's real a real big, a real big benefit of scanning. Can we talk about that one? Sure. Okay. So dimensional drift. Who here has used the laser scanner before? Just one? One? Okay. Two? Did you use targets with it? Yes. Okay. Good. I like to hear that. So a lot of times what we run into with scanning, uh, we like to use cloud to cloud, which is they can scan to scan similarities and tying those two similarities together. Uh, the trouble you can get with that is drift. Uh, and the way we correct drift is with survey control. Um, so here is a kind of a, a, a visual representation as to how dimensional drift is. Uh, imagine you were running your survey down a long hallway uh, and you only constrained it to one end. As you, the farther you get down that hallway, the farther off in either direction your scans can go. You can start running, you know, the, in, in different directions. Same with this. If you constrain it on either end, you can kind of have some movement in the middle. And with this one here, if you constrain it in the middle, it can move on either end. So, uh, you know, we like to put as many constraints down throughout the whole footprint of the project as we can. Um, you know, with the with the scan to scan, cloud to cloud re type registration, uh, it may look really, really good on paper. You may be getting really good residuals, really, really tight numbers out of your software. It's telling you it's good, but in all actuality, it's not. Uh, because scan to scan, it's tied together very, very well. But from scan one to scan 20, it's not. Um, so we like to use this representation to a lot of our clients because there's a lot of there's a lot of competition in this industry that we're in, and that right there is what separates the men's men from the bulls. It separates the engineer. That's <laughs> the engineer would go buy a scanner and hire a button pusher and go out there and not know what they're doing. That's right. And end up with something like this because we we've gone behind like we had data sent to us and said, hey, we did a four thousand foot long pipe rack. We didn't use a single surveyed control point so it's going to be banana shaped and sure enough it was you know 18 inches in vertical so the whole point file went like this over three quarters of the mouth as so, long as you don't blame your oh it's still here that it's still our fault again it don't matter it's all so, so so this right here separates our profession surveying for everybody else and and trying to get this visual to uh, you know our clients and even our internal team like hey this is why you need us and this is why we do what we do you know with putting all these targets out and, and using a, a total station to shoot all this stuff in this is why so it's a, it it separates the surveyors and the engineers in my opinion. okay i'll talk about the nav is so we brought this piece of equipment last year and i think it's currently tied up this week but uh we purchased this about a little less than a year ago uh, and this is SLAM technology, simultaneous uh, LIDAR mapping. So you've got uh, sensors on the on the top and in front of the screen. And, and when you hit go on the, on the screen, set your job up, it's, it's scanning as you're walking. And it's tracking you as you move. You can see your pad, you know, falling around. 
So it's very, very fast. We can get a lot of coverage done in a short amount of time. We still utilize survey control and, and targets control points. We're able to tie that back in. So we, we can combine this with terrestrial scan data, with drone data, with CBS data, and all be integrated into one uh, compiled data set of 3D point cloud. Um, we've done lots of projects in that last year, uh, a lot of the kind of early phase engineering stuff, but they don't really know where things need to go. But they need a general idea of what is currently out there. So we utilize a lot. We like I said, we do a lot of work within industrial plants, and there's a lot of stuff there. And they need civil group needs a topo. Well, if we went to like this was a paper mill and tried to shoot this railroad track, all these building corners, there's process equipment here. You've got bollards and light poles and all kinds of just stuff. If you went out there with a GPS or a toll station and went and did and coded it all in, it would take you days or weeks. So this was about seven acres we did about a day and a half. So um, we're, we're trying to, we're utilizing this tool to kind of shorten the, the build duration and push a more of the um, workload on the offices when we can take that point cloud and then generate a, a 2D survey with a topographic survey. It's not surface from it. Uh, another example, you know, like I said, this is what you would see on the screen as you walk. So the yellow line is your path. And every one of these little red lines you see, they're stopping to picture. So it takes a 360 bubble view is what we call it. Everywhere you can manually stop, say, I want to take a picture here, put the button, that picture, keep on walking. So this right here was this facility where we walked around the perimeter. Um, and then all the, the internal stuff, where you have the process equipment, piping and the racks, and everything we scan with the tripod scanner, you can still see This is a little bit more accurate. Mm -hmm. This data is about plus or minus a quarter inch, whereas the traditional scanner is about 16. And that's point class you're looking at up there. That's not a picture. Okay. So another another service we provide is drones. Uh, we started doing drones about 2018. Uh, started out with a drone called the Intel Falcon 8. It was a pretty cool little drone. It was very dumb. Um, as far as its capabilities, it was very user heavy. Uh, there was a lot of user input for that, but now we swapped over to DJI drone M300, uh, which is really a hands-off type system. Um, so we can use the drone for multiple different things, uh, topographic surveys, you know, picking up just utilities, photos. If we need to just generate a point cloud, we can do that too. Um, we like to use the laser scan with our, with our drone stuff. Uh, we kind of call it the icing on top of the cake. Uh, a lot of the stuff that you can't see from the ground with the scanner, we can get with the drone. And we can marry the two data sets up. Um, you know, and as well, we've got LiDAR. We just started doing LiDAR this past year. Um, in March, March is when we got our LiDAR unit. Uh, we've, we've got one from GOQ, which is up in Huntsville or Madison. Um, and we've been really, really happy with some of the data that we've collected with that there on the left. This is just some test data, the you know, point cloud out of the uh, out of the LiDAR unit there. So another thing we can do with uh, drones is there's a multitude of different sensors that can go on it, thermal cameras. Uh, you know, there's a camera that can see uh, carbons, which are invisible to your eyes. Uh, power line inspections, uh, the whole nine. Uh, we do this occasionally. We get that weird request sometimes. Uh, we got a request last year to take photos of lights inside of the warehouse uh, with a thermal camera because they were overheating. So, uh, you know, we you couldn't, just, them with a, you couldn't get up there with man. There. there was a lot of it was in a steel, a steel mill uh, and large slabs of steel all over the ground uh, and they're moving them constantly. So we had just enough time for them to set down the gantry crane and not move it for a little while. We were able to do one half of the building, take all the photos, then move the gantry crane over. They work on that half of the building while we take pictures of the lights on the other half. Um, but it was just an odd request, but we've done work for that client plenty of times over again. They know that we do drone work, so we we did what we had to to get to work, you know, and we did the job. So uh, don't know how many of y'all have ever looked at LiDAR data, uh, you know, from a drone or an airplane, either or, uh, you know, the main goal with the with the LiDAR as a topo type sense is to get the true ground. 
Um, so you can see in this photo here, uh, you know, this is kind of a little bit thicker slice of the, of the cloud, and this is a much thinner, but you can see the contour of the ground. So uh, those wooded areas, that's what we're after with that LIDAR is to be able to get the ground surface in the wooded areas. Not have to cut line, the uh, least amount of line possible is what we want to get with. Um, so here's a here's an example uh, of a point cloud that we generated from photogrammetry. This is inside of a chemical facility up in North Alabama. Um, but this is generated strictly from photos. Um, and we use this data set really to capture the tops of these pipe rack structures here and some of these structures that are up ladders and what have you. Uh, but we did a lot of scanning at gray, uh, you know, to capture data, but we married it to uh So uh, this is another interesting one we did with a drone. This was all the way up in New York. Uh, we drove up there and did a little topo, uh, it's a pretty big topo, of this entire site uh, with the drone uh, for flood modeling. Uh, this facility here had a bunch of uh, uh, organic peroxide, which has to stay refrigerated or else it becomes explosive. Um, and what they're running into is when the river, which is up here in this photo, uh, when the river flooded, um, it would flood the facility and the refrigeration units were sitting on the ground, which would cause the refrigeration units to go down. And then they were scrambling, trying to keep their peroxide cold. Um, so we generated this topo and then our engineering group modeled a flood to know what was going to go underwater first. So that was just kind of a multidiscipline job for us there, which was pretty cool. So uh, another one, another cool tool we get to work with is bathymetric boat, uh, which just, it has a single beam sonar uh, unit on the bottom of it, which is pinging sound waves down to um, the, the, the I guess, top of silt and get a return so we can get a point, you know, at whatever interval we, we choose uh, to generate a, a topo of what's underneath the, the water surface. Uh, oh, Troy Long right there. It's yeah, that's Reed Jones. I don't know if you remember him or yeah. not. Dr. You want to see a lot of time. Yeah. Or Dr. Reed. Dr. Reed. Uh, but yeah. Say what? It's, it's Matthew Boat. <laughs> um, so the last kind of service that our group does is uh, what we call the Mission Control. And kind of the best way to describe this is utilize survey total station. We have one second total station. And these guys measure specific points on the critical components of an engineering design project in these uh, heavy industrial facilities to make sure that what was what was actually fabricated match matches what design said it should be and then taking it a step further okay it matches is it actually going to fit where we want this stuff to fit so um it's it usually comes after way after the fact you know um right before they start doing construction um most of the guys will go to a fabrication shop they'll work pipes so the pipe spools are just sections of pipe that all fit up together that are all um, you know welded together in the field or they got flame connections where they, they bolt up so say a, a run a 100 foot pipe run has four spools and it bends two or three times they can take all those pipe spools that they surveyed in do a virtual fit up in autocad and then compare it to where it's supposed to fit at point a and point b in the field and then kind of another layer to that is taking into account thermal expansion um if within this particular unit if, if the pipe is at a certain location here with um product runs through it at 600 degrees when it cools off it's going to shrink and it can shrink you know laterally it can shrink vertically and they're able to to locate certain certain aspects along that um that pipeline to be able to determine where it's going to be when it's at ambient temperature that way whenever they go and fit the new stuff in, it's going to be an ambient that there's no product going through it. So we can shut down, they can make sure that it's going to fit up. Um, they're the, they're like the, they're the critical fit up guys. And I don't know what, what other 
Whether it's, it's got to fit. They don't want to yeah, they're, they're, in, they're our client's insurance policy because if they get, you know, for example, this this is a heater at an oil refinery in Mississippi. And you can see how big it is. Um, this is an older project when they were working at another company, but now they work for us. But they were tasked with, you know, shooting this new piece of this furnace heater uh, to make sure that these bottom connections, when the crane picks it up and sets it down on the existing steel supports, that the bolt holes are going to line up, everything's going to fit where a pipe needs to fit, and they're not going to have to push and pull and cut and weld and do everything to make it fit. Because, one, that big crane right there is expensive, <laughs> very expensive. And every minute that it's delayed longer than what the client had paid for it to be there is money. Not only have to pay them, and you got laborers on site, all the construction folks doing all the fit up and everything, and then the unit's not running. So they're not making product. They're not making product. They're not making money. So from if you look at it from that standpoint, we are a very cheap insurance policy for them to make sure. And I mean, throw in a, the two hundred thousand dollars out on a survey job like this to have them on site for two weeks while they're doing this work can save them seven figures. Very, very easy. So, um, as I mentioned, they use a, a total station, and this is kind of a representation of what they would do. This, you know, is a CAD um, shot of, of the points, the, the different shots they would take. Uh, this is a vertical process column in the refinery. They would then take these, these shots they had on all their, their nozzles and connections, the stick figure model, and then we could even take it a step further and put a nice skin on it and make it look like an actual uh, vertical structure so that's all that i want to go back to and just kind of give you all a, a glimpse of what the data looks like that's your no okay it it that's so half the job right there yeah. like i said we we utilize the the principles of survey and all the different tools that we have in our toolbox, we can apply in different, unique, creative ways to help solve problems for our clients. Our biggest client is, is Hard Road Internal the Engineering teams in all of our offices. We support all, we support 17 of the 19 offices. The two in Mexico, we, we don't go down there and scan. A lot of the plants in Mexico are in not very safe area. So we're not going to go down there with $150,000 equipment. <laughs> but 17 of the 19 of our U.S. offices, we support all of all of those um, out of our six locations. And, you know, anything dimensionally that they need measured that got any kind of crit criticality to it or a time saving component, you know. Yeah, they, the office could send a designer out to go and out with a, with a plumb bob and take measure and sketch pad and take measurements of you know, a part of a pipe rack that they need to put a new a new line in, and it might take them several days. We can go out there and do that. So, um, utilize all the tools, utilize the principles of, of surveying, uh, which we learned here at Shoreway, and apply them in unique ways to help to help solve problems and um, with the with the yeah. folks. And even we've applied some of the law perspectives to it. I mean, here recently, we're trying to figure out if we can do a job in a different state that we're not licensed in. You know, is is that considered surveying? Is it considered, you know, scanning? What what is it? And trying to find the the in betweens on the line of the law to figure out if we can do that work or not. You know, because uh, I don't want to put my license at risk. Adam doesn't want to put his license at risk. I don't want to put Harvard at risk. You know. So knowing how to interpret the laws, especially, is it's very important. Yeah, and you know, depending on the state, um, we do we do boundary work. We're licensed in in five states, but actually six. We got North Carolina now too, which Reed Reed has more on the list. Um, we do do boundary work every now and then. It's not something that we really get asked a lot to do, uh, but it is something we've done. You know, all the surveys and your traditional. You know, lot surveys and rural track boundaries, that sort of thing. It's just not something we do a ton of. Our our niche is in the industrial sector, um, and you know we're a service that you know Harvard as a company offers, but without us 
the engineering team, the design team couldn't do the work. So um, they've got you've got to have good a good survey, um, whatever that is, whether it's boundary, whether it's topo, whether it's a roll lidar or a 3D laser scan to be able to do and complete a project or engineering design, you know, correctly and accurately so that everything's gonna work. Give us some idea about the employment package for opportunity. So currently we have two open positions. Uh, one in Savannah and one in Baton Rouge. So we are, those positions are posted and I can send them to the needs to put on the um, Facebook page. But we've got two, two openings uh, in those offices. Um, we traditionally haven't done co-ops or interns. Uh, mainly due to the fact that a lot of our larger clients don't want temporary teammates, we call it some teammates, to work within the facilities. So that's been kind of a handcuff for us when a lot of our work, you know, is in a, in a refinery or a chemical plant. And if we can't get, if we can't get you in there, you know, that's the 75% of your, your summer. Just kind of, I don't want to, I don't want to bring an intern in just to, you know, there's my honey desk. It's not a desk the whole time. Well, actually, you know, immerse them in what we do day in, day out and get exposed to, you know, another, another aspect of what surveying industry is, you know, besides just doing plot surveys or all the surveys. Y'all, y'all, for a 401k match? Mm -hmm. 401k, we do the, uh, I think ours is a 6%. That's or you put in three, they match three. Um, fifty percent of the six. So yeah, yeah they do that. Put it six, they match three. Right. We are also an employee on company. One hundred percent. We're teammate on all sales teammates. So there is a a stock stock ownership program uh, that I think it after six months you're eligible for if you're a full time uh, teammate, and the company puts in two percent of your salary towards that. So they don't they don't take two percent of what you make. They contribute. 2% of what you would make to that. And then, so as the company grows and does well, then that dividend every year that account throws along with it. And the longer you're there and, you know, you get raises or promotions, the more you get paid, so the more shares you get. So um, it's full, full line of benefits as far as health, dental insurance. Um, I'm not, not too keen on what all hard of offers from that perspective, <laughs> but um, we do have, you know, some harder of swag up here. There's information on our website if you got specific questions, but uh, we, we'd have a work, a kind, of, kind of a flexible work schedule. I, I'd say that our company policy is we work four ends. So Monday through Thursday, we work 14 hour days. You have all Friday, Saturday, Sunday. For the majority of the company that works for us, if it rains on Monday, we can't get filled on Monday, we're doing it on Friday. So, you know, we're, we have to kind of work with how how our work schedule does and what workload looks like. But I'd say for the most part, more than half the time, you know, we have three-day weekends. So yeah. that's that's it's a typical pretty nice. Or we've kind of we've kind of refined the working from home to, you know, on the office process inside. We've got it to where we can work from the house if we need to. I mean, nine times out of ten. Most Saturdays and Sundays, I've got something going on the computer just because a lot of our data takes a long time to process. So, you know, I'm constantly checking in on it, making sure it's running. Plus, it runs faster when nobody else is using our bandwidth, you know. Um, so we like to do a lot of our stuff at night or weekends, you know, just just to kind of ease the ease the pain of waiting. No, in light of the um you don't do as much boundary service. Would you be interested in looking for students who might decide not to go for their license? And be most certainly to your most certainly. We uh as it sits right now, there's one, there's four of four of us that have uh you know surveying degrees. Uh honestly and truly the, the best people we find are the ones that just have a good attitude and want to work, you know. If you want to see if you want to see the country we can send you just about anywhere you want to go yeah I, you know that that right now is probably one of the hardest things is finding somebody that's willing to go uh you know i i've traveled to 
I know at least all of the Eastern half and a lot of the Western too of the United States. Uh, I think I'm getting well up into the high thirties, if not forties of how many states that I've been to working in. We've currently got just in the next two or three weeks, a big from Idaho, Michigan, Virginia, and Florida, all like the plan over the next two or three weeks. <coughs> so not to mention all the other stuff we do in our local. Right. And you will do some international project in Florida? Yeah, we, they, they come here and there since the whole COVID thing kind of kind of boiled down a little bit. I think everybody's kind of figured out what to do to not have to do all that. But um, yeah, we've done Shanghai, China, and I went to Jordan uh, a couple of years ago. I know I I called you not that. It's been a few years ago about a job in Trinidad. You know, um, so we have them come up every now and again. We we estimate them to the best best we can. If they happen, it's honestly a lot. You know. Yeah. I feel like we estimate a whole bunch of these out of, out of the country trips. Yeah, they don't ever. Yeah. We might get one in every year. You know. Yeah, it so, would not. Would not have happened in Toronto. Um, so these are very costly projects, right? Very. Do we need to answer this question? What's the most costly domestic you ever made? Oh, I, I, I got one. I got one. What are you doing? Yeah, that happened this year. It's uh, about a ninety ninety thousand dollar mistake. And you're still employed, right? I'm still here <laughs> for now. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and all that had to do with was uh had to do with uh, the site control monuments the monuments that we used the coordinates that i used did not match the coordinate values that were on the ground it was sitting about uh two inches yeah we were about two inches high Ooh, the whole so, thing old, for everything we had all skinned into was was about that far and it probably could have been worse than that as far as the the ninety thousand dollar mistake everything they were building was in a floodplain so there was minimum flood elevation that everything had to be set at. Luckily, they had designed everything well above that. But if they would have designed it at that elevation, we'd have been two inches low on all the concrete that they just put. So, yes. yes, it was a costly mistake. It happens. And you, you learn from it. Moment. You do what you need to to make yeah, sure that they come out of it because the area that so it was an existing facility and they, they were in an open area where there was nothing they were building. Even. So all of the stuff they were building the new unit was fine. Problem was when they were running pipe, the interface with the existing, the existing was showing here and they're running their pipe is sort of the opposite way. Everything was high. So what they ended up having to do was they had to um, modify all the steel supports and cut off that two and a three sixteenths inch, whatever it was vertically to get everything back down. Yep. And that that labor and that construction costs and material and everything is what all added up to about this nothing grand. Now we haven't been served notice like hey you owe us this amount of money, but we're fully we're expecting the worst case on that towards the end of the year if they come back and say so they can go with that. So yeah, it's I mean this much do it y'all by two inches on elevation. So then we submit a project thing and did I check everything? So yes. Did I check? Yes. Yes. So we've got now it's procedures and workflows and checklists and nothing should go out, you know, without me, Ty, Marty, Reed, somebody else looking at it and making sure that things good, you know, that things where they need to be. We've got certain workflow, field workflows in place to not completely eliminate, you know, because there's always going to be human error. Mm -hmm. But try and minimize it, our exposure as much as possible. What's the biggest difference on this PLS exchange? Arkansas is hard. Very good. <laughs> uh, Alabama's is a history test. Okay. So is Mississippi's. Uh, if you have any intention on doing it PLS in Louisiana, know your uh, water boundaries. Also, there was That's a lot cool. of yeah. water boundary in yeah. the And it's French. Like, well, it's not English. Florida the same way. Florida was actually, I didn't think Florida was that bad, but that was 15 years ago. So I'm not sure what it's like now. But there was a lot of condo stuff in Florida. Mm -hmm. um, that type of stuff. Flight certification. Uh, so what happens? I do. Yeah, we've got six, six or seven guys that all have it now. 
so maybe yeah, two or three will actually kind of power supply. Yeah, you yeah. know. So we have a standard that we, you know, established in our clients actually is, you know, they want us to have a certain amount of flight hours before we fly in their facility. So <laughs> we have to go for one of our oil and gas clients, they have a really, really stringent process to get uh able to fly in their facility. You know, that's a I don't know, it's about six weeks or so. Six weeks, six week process. Yeah. Of an audit. I mean, they sent down a guy that was over all of their aviation stuff. They came down and looked through all of our paperwork, looked at us. We had to fly for them. You know, it was a pretty big process to be able to fly. But now we can do it. We can fly in any of their facilities in the nation. As long as it's on land, none, none of their offshore platforms. But, um, on land, we can do any of their facilities, no problem. Helping on the I used to work at Food Grove. I graduated Troy. I went to work at Food Grove out of Houston. I, I know we had a company. I think there's been one or two opportunities that kind of step. Hargrove's more on the midstream side of things, you know. Um, I guess what could be considered downstream, downstream I guess. Downstream. So, yeah. We do mainly the outstream stuff, so we're on the refining side. And we get, like, like we said, we get these really oddball projects that pop up here and there. You know, um, me and Adam were just talking before we got here. I was telling, you know, we were talking about football coming up, and I said, oh, well, I watched the Alabama football game last year in a shipyard because I was helping, a, I was helping some folks that worked in a shipyard cut a boat in half. Um, I was giving them measurements the whole way down to keep their cut line straight all the way across so that when they show the boat back together, you know, um, it, it went together right. It wasn't dog legged or anything like that. Uh, really, really weird request. Never in a million years of my surveying that I think I would help cut a boat in half, but. I it, was, it was 240 foot long. Yeah, it was, a, it was a ship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yes, yeah. it, it was big. They yeah. cut a 20, 24, like, foot. 24 foot section out of the middle of it and then shoved it back together. It was cheaper to cut a boat in a section, shove it back together than it was to build a whole new boat. So, so these jobs are based upon a job itself, not like an everyday thing where how many hours you put in, it's millions of dollars that you all are bidding for. Right? I mean, our group, we're dropping the bucket considering an engineer project. Engineer project service ridiculously expensive you know yeah so about as a company overall Argo is about 600 million dollar in revenue company our group our 18 17 18 people of us we're about three so just kind of something gauged by but but two or three years ago we're about making so we tripled in three four years you know with, with growth and as our company grows kind of we our group grows with it so it's the engineering units that grows. I fully expect probably our next expansion might be up in Columbus, Ohio. That's one of our newer offices in the U.S. And they're kind of centrally located with a lot of our facilities that are in West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Indiana, Kentucky. So, you know, we grow and add more to our group. It would probably be up there in the Midwest. Any more questions? Appreciate y'all's time today. Stopping by for lunch. Soon we have to talk. Thank you for yeah. Thank you for providing information. Thank you for providing the lunch. We do appreciate all what you've done and the past year coming back and recruiting students, graduates, like yourself, um, those of you are interested in contact them. Um, we have a vibrant um, student chapter officer sit here. We want you all, if you want to come and meet with them, Maybe sponsor again, not you up a tailgating event, and these students won't be there. Please let us know. Reach out to our student president chapter. Make it happen. Thank you very much for your time. I see there is yes, a swag. Yes, yes, so thank, thank you. 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 Thank In a month. Oh.